Again, good evening. My name is Jeff Lindauer, Interim Assistant Vice President for Academic Affairs. Unfortunately, President Hurley was unable to join us this evening. It's my great honor to welcome you to our campus for tonight's Symposium on Educational Equity in Western New York. Welcome to our two keynote speakers, Professor John Britton and Dr. Peter Cookson, whose report released by the Learning Policy Institute in February of 2019 sets the stage for tonight's discussion. And welcome to all of you, college faculty, teachers, administrators, superintendents, students, local church leaders, elected officials, members of the media. Thank you for being here this evening. This event is being sponsored by the Center, for, uh, the Canisius College Center for Urban Education, which our School of Education and Human Services created in 2017 to focus our efforts in preparing the next generation of teachers and to contribute to educational equity in our region, state, and country. This symposium is an important expression of the Canisius College mission. As a Jesuit college, we are called to promote justice in our world. In spring of 2017, the Education Trust of New York published a report titled Achievement and Opportunity in New York State. This report described the state of our education system and offered a series of recommendations for improving equity, achievement, and opportunity. At that time, some of the findings from the report were New York trails most of the country on reading and math achievement, and its, import, and its performance relative to other states is declining. New York is investing the least resources in the students and communities with the greatest needs, depriving low-income students and students of color of the educational opportunities that can transform their lives. New York's resource gaps and uneven academic expectations quickly become opportunity gaps for students who lose access to higher level courses and advanced learning opportunities that prepare them for college and high skill careers. And finally, inequitable access to excellent teachers and school leaders further institutionalizes the state's achievement and opportunity gaps. Professor Britton's and Dr. Cookson's talk and conversation tonight seeks to help us see alternatives to education funding that has shown promise in, in other parts of the country. I'm happy that you all uh, are with us here tonight to engage in this conversation. Canisius is celebrating 150 years as a college in Western New York and has always viewed, its, uh, viewed itself as an integral contributor to the progress of our city and region. It is this vision of Canisius that led to the creation of the Center for Urban Education and partnership with the National Urban Alliance to improve the quality of education in our region. Although he was unable to join us this evening, I also want to recognize Dr. Eric Cooper, the CEO of the National Urban Alliance, who continues to work with us on these critical issues facing our school districts and community. I look forward to hearing Professor Britton and Dr. Cookson in the audience's participation uh, after their presentation. Thank you and enjoy the evening. Hello, good evening. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Dr. Nancy Wallace, Interim Dean of the College's School of Education and Human Services. I'd like to thank you for joining us here tonight as we welcome keynote speakers, Professor John Britton and Dr. Peter Cookson, who will discuss sharing the wealth, how regional finance and desegregation plans can enhance educational equity. After their presentations, they will offer a question and answer session. It is now my pleasure to introduce our presenters this evening. John Britton, Professor of Law at the University of the District of Columbia, and Dr. Peter Cookson, a senior researcher um, at the Learning Policy Institute. 
John Britton joined the faculty of the University of the District of Columbia David A. Clark School of Law in 2009 as a tenured professor of law and served as acting dean from 2018 to 2019. Previously, he served as the dean of the Thurgood, Thurgood Marshall School of Law at Texas Southern University, as a tenured law professor at the University of Connecticut, and as chief counsel and senior deputy director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights under, the, under law. Professor Britton writes and litigates on issues in civil and human rights, especially in education law. He, served at, he has served as president of the National Lawyers Guild and in leadership roles at the ACLU and the NAACP. Peter W. Cookson, Jr. co-leads the Learning Policy Institute's Equitable Resources and Access Team and provides leadership for several equity initiatives. In addition to teaching sociology at Georgetown University, he co-leads the American Voices Project, a joint research project of Stanford University, Princeton University, and the American Institutes for Research. Uh, Dr. Cookson began his career as a caseworker in New York City and as a teacher in rural Massachusetts. Most recently, he was the managing director of the think tank Education Sector and founded the Equity Project at American Institutes for Research. He is the author of 16 books and numerous articles on education and inequality, social stratification, and school choice and 21st century education. Dr. Cookson has a PhD in the sociology of education from New York University and MA in American history from New York University and NAR from the Yale Divinity School and a BA in history from New York University. Wow. Um, and it is now my um, distinct pleasure to welcome Professor John Britton to the stage. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Dean Wallace, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you, Dr. Mendauer, for inviting me to come talk tonight. I am a legal drum major for justice, as Dr. Martin Luther King would say. I've been in the law for 50 years in pursuit of educational equity. One of my law professors back in the late 1960s was trained by Charles Hamilton Houston, the father of the modern day thesis that de jure segregated education was inherently unequal and a violation of the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause. Charles Hamilton Houston was the dean of my law school, alma mater, Howard University, and a leading civil rights lawyer who headed the NAACP's legal department. He was the one who brought the Brown versus Board of Education case. Charles Hamilton used to train Thurgood Marshall, certainly one of my mentors. And he also trained Herbert O'Reilly, who was my mentor in law school, and who was a co-counsel with Charles Hamilton Houston in one of the five Brown versus Board of Education cases. And he was the lead lawyer in the Washington, D.C. case. So he trained me in law school. And therefore, I consider myself a third generation negative of Charles Hamilton Houston in the pursuit of educational equity. In our report, with my dear colleague here, Dr. Cookson, I am going to lay the foundation for the premise that sharing the wealth, how regional finance and desegregation plans can enhance educational equity. I consider myself a part of this region. 
because I spent 22 years at the University of Connecticut School of Law in Hartford, Connecticut, a eastern neighbor of or upstate as well as downstate New York too. And during my 22 year tenure there, I followed in my mentor, Charles Hamilton Houston's footsteps with one foot in the classroom teaching and the other foot in the courtroom litigating civil rights cases. Even though history is soon, but many commentators have said that the suit in which I participated as one of the lead lawyers with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, which was the chief lawyer in the Brown case, and with the American Civil Liberties Union, with various legal services program, and even the Puerto Rican Legal Defense Fund, we brought a very successful case that to Connecticut is what Brown versus Board of Education to the United States overall. And a case style, Chef versus O'Neill, held that students in Connecticut had a fundamental right to education under the state constitution for a suitable and efficient and equal and minimum educational opportunity to be free from racial isolation on unequal educational opportunities, including the high concentration of poverty. I'll fast forward just a sec. That suit was decided in 1996 and reshaped the thesis of our report in our talk tonight in regional education or inter-district education because the cause of much segregation is the silo of high concentrations of poverty and racial isolation and unequal educational attainment in large urban areas, but it also spreads into surrounding suburban areas. But the key is to merge these districts into inter-district school assignments to take advantage of both the wealth in education, the wealth in funding, the wealth in opportunity, and the wealth of the educational advantages of a diverse education. One of the things that leads to this discussion today is that the case called Chef versus O'Neill was the first case, and so far as I've been able to find, the only case that said that the system of designing school districts that largely separates often haves and have nots, particularly urban and suburban, was the cause of the racial isolation and the unfair and unequal educational policies. No other case has found that it's the district boundary line, which I call equivalent in my scholarship and in my writing, to the old Jim Crow line between black and white and no colors allowed. So it's one of the barriers that were struck down to lead to the opportunity of a remedy of a regional education plan and the report goes into educational details about what it takes to create an effective and efficient regional plan. I want to stop here and say that I operate on a mantra which teams me up perfectly with Dr. Cookson tonight. And my mantra is, I know as a civil rights lawyer who also teaches in higher education when my expertise on legal equality ends and my ignorance on sound educational policy begins. So I'm always traveling and always operating in this advocacy sphere of court litigation, of educational policy advocacy, of teaching with educators such as Dr. Cookson that's informed on sound educational policy. And it makes a partnership between advocacy, like Dr. Charles Hamilton Houston, and the many social scientists and historians and educators that were a part of the Brown team. One example of that 
is that Charles Hamilton Houston proved in court one of the disadvantages of segregation in the influence on small children. And he worked with a leading educational psychologist named Clark. And Dr. Clark conducted these what are called white doll tests on black children, giving them white dolls and black dolls, and studying their interaction to show the adverse effects of de jure segregation in which barriers of color existed in every segment of our society, not only in education, in accommodations, and in transportation, and in housing, and employment throughout, both in the South and beyond. And one of the things they proved in this doll test with Dr. Kenneth Clark was the negative impact that racial segregation had on black children in identifying white dolls as positive and non-white dolls as negative. So that's an example of the partnership between civil rights lawyers and, in my case, legal educators like Dr. and like Charles Hamilton Houston and other social scientists. And so, this Shep case was the one that held that the district boundary line is the cause of the racial isolation and unequal educational opportunities. Without going too deep into the legal woods, the Shep case was also another breakthrough. One of the legal requirements is that lawyers who bring complaints for civil rights, particularly under constitutional grounds, have to prove what is known as intent. They have to prove that the respondent intended to create segregated systems and unequal and unfair systems. It's a hard standard to prove in many cases. When we brought the Connecticut case, we were in state court instead of federal court. The federal court had already created this high barrier of intent. We brought a case the first of its time, testing several constitutional provisions in the Connecticut Constitution both for equality, as well as the fundamental right to education. But one clause that had never been tested, and that was one that said there shall be no discrimination or segregation, quote unquote, in the exercise of a fundamental right. So we put together the fundamental right to an equal educational opportunity with the no segregation and the no discrimination clause and presented it to the court as the constitutional violation for existence of segregated and unequal education in Connecticut. And the court accepted our thesis, went on to accept our proof of trial, and went on to identify, too, the high concentration of poverty was directly linked to the low performance of students. And so, Chef became the first case to look at de facto segregation, that is, segregation not created by intent and statutes, but segregation that exists from a combination of multiple factors, including private factors in banking, public factors in transportation, corporate and business practices in locations, and access to jobs, and many other factors. But it can be traced to bias and discrimination in many instances. And so, to allow us to sue on the segregation itself and the state's negligence in failing to correct it, created a constitutional right that led to a successful decision based upon this de facto test and not having to prove the intent. There was something else quite significant about the Connecticut case too. And that was, it led to the thesis again of this talk on the advantages of regional education. So since the case declared that the district boundary line was the cause of the racial isolation largely in the urban districts and that it was unconstitutional, it left the remedy for regional education. And that remedy, in short, was satisfied by two components. One was Connecticut long had a plan in which students in urban areas could transfer to seats available 
in more advantageous suburban schools. It was called Project Concern. It started even before the lawsuit. After we won the lawsuit, the school adapted it, changed its name, expanded it, and calls it now School Choice. But it became a regional plan. The next segment, again to the thesis of the wealth and the opportunity in regional education to promote diversity and higher educational attainment, was the creation of a series of magnet schools, some in Hartford, some in suburbs, some along the borderline, with no residential requirement for attendance. Because it not only was a magnet school, but it was a regional school. And that's been the successful element in this chef plan. And that's one of the three models that Dr. Cookson will show you on slides today that led to the positive conclusion about its success. But in order to get to that point, the seeds were set through the decision in this shift case, a partnership between civil rights law and educational advocates for the educational proven benefits of diversity in schools. Benefits that he will go into some more detail, but certainly includes not only enhanced educational achievement and attainment, but more particularly to move more freely and navigate through integrated settings and led to better jobs, better housing, but particularly higher attainment beyond their current location. And so when I look over this partnership between civil rights law and educators, I come to uh, one of these uh, conclusions. I come to the conclusion as the court said here, that although the constitutional basis for the plaintiff's claims is the deprivation that they themselves are suffering, and they were a host of multi-diverse plaintiffs that we carefully selected from the suburbs, from the urban areas, from low income, medium, and higher social economic income, from advantage and disadvantage, from Latinx, African Americans, Asian Pacific to Native American Indians, large West Indian population within the greater Hartford area. And so, although the constitutional basis of the plaintiff's claim is the deprivation that they are suffering, that deprivation potentially has an impact on the entire state and its economy, not only on the social and cultural fabric, but on the material well-being, on its jobs, its industry, and its business. Economists and business leaders say that our state's economic well-being is dependent on the more skilled workers, technically proficient workers, literate, and well-educated citizens. And they point to the urban poor as an integral part of the future of our economic strength. So it is not just that their future depends on the state, the state's future depends upon them. And they cited a New Jersey case and the New Jersey case, called Abbott and Burke, was also another case that held in a suit there that regional education was an option. And the court found, although they never implemented it, like the one we have in Connecticut, that regional education is available so long as it's feasible. Well, feasible is what everybody wants. So in other words, regional education is available in New Jersey, but no case has ever tested any remedy in litigation. There's a case pending now, and I'm going to be speaking on that uh, next month. And so let me just turn now to the state of New York. In the late 1990s, early 2000s, I attempted to export the chef case to the Empire State of New York. And we chose Rochester, New York, because it was very similar to our venue, that's where Sue had brought, in Hartford, Connecticut, with over a dozen surrounding more mainly advanced districts with very small or varying percentages of diversity. So we chose Rochester, New York, and we brought a case called Painter versus New York. And Painter sought to piggyback on a leading New York State constitutional case called Campaign for Fiscal Equity. And the campaign for fiscal equity was a suit that said that 
New York failed to meet its education cost standards of a suitable and efficient minimum education by unequal funding, largely between advantaged school districts and disadvantaged school districts. And the campaign for fiscal equity set off a wave of suits. Nearly in three quarters of the states that have changed the method of funding from the equal, both for a district with high concentration of poverty that requires more resources to provide an educational district than from an advantaged district. And all of local education is funded partly by state funds, but mainly by local funds, particularly from a tax on property. And they get funds from all other sources too, private as well as the federal government. But the state's constitutional act obligation is to provide equal funding. And this campaign for fiscal equity was a suit that established that standard. So we sought to come over here and piggyback on the campaign for fiscal equity and to sue the state of New York on behalf of Rochester and several of the surrounding districts to import the CHEF regional remedy and to establish a cause of action that low performing schools with high concentrations of poverty and the Rochester case, different from the Connecticut case, the Connecticut case was decided on the racial isolation. We call that the Brown versus Board of Education claim. We have the same poverty and disadvantage claim because poverty is the most statistically significant factor in determining educational disadvantage. But the court decided, although it accepted the finding that it was directly linked to low education performance, it chose the Brown versus Board of Education claim to establish this fundamental first ever constitutional right to equal education, equal opportunity, and free from racial isolation in Connecticut. So we've got to bring that here, excuse me, to New York. And we decided to piggyback, piggyback on the campaign for physical equity case called CFC, CFP rather, and the trial court denied us. And the trial court held that the only right to extend the fundamental right to education under what is called New York's education clause was in unequal funding or fiscal issues. And they turned down our claim for racial isolation with all of its proven standards from Brown Board of Education to the Connecticut and to New York in Ohio, excuse me, in Ohio, uh, uh, Hawaii is the only other district with the kind of clauses that New Jersey and Connecticut have to make this suit much more persuasive. But the Court of Appeals, as the New York Court of Highest Decision, Supreme Court called in other districts, turned down that remedy and they will go no farther than extending educational equity and not for racial isolation. So they stopped with the family, but not for the desegregation. However, that has not stopped advocates here in New York. It was a good education, it was a good finding, but it paves the way, as I keep saying, for regional education. And it paves the way, as you see in the report, from voluntary. So today, as I begin to wind up, all pursuit of school diversity for the sociological, educational, and individual advantages of an integrated education are voluntary. The law is divided into two segments. One is liability, one is remedy. The liability is like a battle, and many battles have been won particularly in civil rights cases. But the remedy is the war. So many have won the battle, but lost the war through the inadequacy of the remedy. And that's what we pick up today with this new period of voluntary remedies in the continuing pursuit of educational equity. And so I close with one of my motivating premises upon which I've operated for the last five years from my beloved intellectual mentor, Charles Hamilton Houston, 
who died in 1950, 52, two years before the 1954 decision. When he died, I was only seven or eight years old. But I've lived under his motto throughout my career. And Houston said this, a lawyer is either a social engineer or a parasite on society. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Britt. Um, please give a warm welcome to Peter, uh, Dr. Peter Cookson. Thank you for coming out on this school. <laughs> I think I've got it. Well, let me first say, glad to be here. Thank you, Nancy, Jeff, Kathleen, I don't know she's in the audience. Um, this beautiful setting. Uh, welcome from Georgetown, other Jesuit institution. Um, I'm going to try to follow in John's footsteps. This is an impossibility. Um, John's done more for our educational equity probably than anybody else I know, so fantastic. Somewhere I put my notes, so there they are, but I think I'll just talk about them. So let me, um, let me just talk a little bit about the study we did, contextualize it a little bit. We're going to keep it pretty sharp and to the point so we have plenty of time for conversation. So, so from a research point of view and from a policy point of view, the evidence that integration helps all students is very powerful. For those of you who um, haven't read his book by Robert Johnson, just recently did a book, he's an economist out at the University of California, he recently did a book on uh, in uh, integration, busing, and so forth. And what he was trying to make the argument was that even though this uh, those policies have come under a lot of criticism. The actual data show that it actually benefited a lot of kids, not just in terms of what they learned in school, but their careers afterward and long term. So when you think about integration, it isn't just, we can talk about math and, and, and reading scores, but actually what you're talking about is a return to society. And with the society we live in is very, very different than the society of, of even 50 years ago or even 20 years ago. We're multicultural. 50, well, more than 50% of the kids who go to public education from public education are, are eligible for free and reduced price lunch. Uh, any of those of you have been out and about, uh, you know, I started as a fifth grade teacher in a rural school. I went back there a few years ago and it hadn't changed a great deal and I was pretty heartbreaking to me. I don't want to hit myself in this, it sounds like I don't have to remember that. Um, um, hadn't really made much difference in their lives and the economy has changed dramatically as well. So what was acceptable, maybe, maybe never was acceptable, what was possible? Maybe and 20 years ago even or beyond, uh, no longer is true. So we've got a real crisis in our hands and, and integrating schools is a big part. Of that. Not only do we see uh, evidence of student gains, we also see lower dropout rates, but here's the thing I really want to emphasize. Stronger intergroup relations and poverty, positive outcomes beyond. And now we need, in this day and age, young people who are prepared to participate in democracy. And I don't see we can, can't do it without a firm understanding of the power of integration. So interdistrict, John touched on all this stuff, so I don't want to repeat what he said, but just to kind of crystallize a little bit in your minds so when we talk about it. I think you all have some LPI stuff in your folders, so you can read it in some depth. Um, first off, they're voluntary. That's important. Uh, this isn't mandated by the government, uh, although the courts play a big role in this, but it's voluntary. And the examples I'm going to give, uh, discuss with you in a minute, very briefly, are all voluntary. Now, here's, here's a key variable. Those of you, um, I was going to ask you to raise your hands up again, lapsing into the Georgetown teaching room or something here. But um, those of you who have been in different kinds of schools, those of you either as students, as teachers, perhaps as parents, uh, perhaps as citizens, know that the resources that are available to kids uh, is highly dependent on the community in which they live. And the 
lower the economic viability, lower the income, by and large, with few exceptions, fewer resources. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute, what this really means in terms of equity. A couple years ago, I did a study where I visited schools that were um, five different kinds of services. It was a very elite private school, school in the upper middle class neighborhood, school in the middle class neighborhood, working class neighborhood, and then school in a very poor neighborhood. And I had a kind of thesis about it in terms of how kids were socialized in those schools. And of course, because I trust my own thesis, I thought I proved it, but that really wasn't what came away with. What I came away with, even though I've been looking at schools, I was a teacher, I've been in education all my life, so nothing really shocks me, but, but even that, I was shocked. I was shocked because in the morning I go to one school and they had all these academic benefits, they had highly qualified teachers, the facilities were great, some of them had bigger science labs and some small colleges, lots of athletic activities for a whole variety, not just the super athletes, but for the student body, counselors, um, uh, medical care, all kinds of food, and as you, then you get in the car, and they weren't too far from each other, which is telling, telling. Um, and you go to a school in which none of these things existed. There was, to get in, you had to go through the, one of these things, like a security things that you have at the airport, badly run, um, the school wasn't very clean, uh, the curriculum was extremely weak, um, many of these young, young people had not been to a doctor, and so it was great to have a whiteboard, but if you can't see it, it doesn't help. And the food was different. I don't know, it doesn't always seem to be the big education mission, but it's just struck me so powerfully. I went to the principal, I knew this principal from before, and I said, you know, I said, I want to do the study. He said, what are you going to give the kids? And I said, I've never had that question before. So what should I give them? He said, bring them food, because they're always hungry. So we have this stratified school system. So the sharing of resources is a big part of this. And, and the local contest matters too. They're not all the same. So we're going to take a quick, brief look. It's in your, it's in your floors. At three, three breakout ideas, really, to get out school boundaries. It's really a breakout idea. One in Boston, Mass. I think John covered Hartford very well, so I'll just touch on that. And one in Omaha, Nebraska. So we should ask ourselves key questions before we get too deeply into it. Because it, we want to be analytical as well as just descriptive about it. If they are good, if this is a good idea to have these inter, inter district uh, desegregation plans, what do you need to do in order for them to be successful? So here's some questions. How was it created? Who created it? Was it grassroots? Was it a mandate? Was it a court order? It makes a difference. It makes a difference in how they operate. Who initiated the plan? Was it a community folks? Was it, uh, again, a, maybe a court mandated? Um, was it a, a powerful group of legislators? All these things make a difference in terms of its viability and how it's perceived, because we'll, we'll see, maintaining it can be difficult. Who's responsible for the financial stability of this? And that, we'll see in one particular case, is a huge issue. Who, you see, once you ask school districts, those of you who know school districts, school districts are little kingdoms. So the idea of, of sharing your wealth with another district sounds maybe fine around the seminar table, but doesn't actually always work out in real life, because it's, Partly because it's tax-based and people, people feel some sense of ownership, but it goes deeper also. It goes deeper into this is our community and so forth and so on. So that's very important. And how is progress measured and not just measuring it, did, they, did the students do better on math and English, but how about their growth in terms of associated, uh, emotional growth, in terms of being, able to, uh, being ready for career and uh, college, being able to uh, uh, survive emotionally in a world that's very competitive, so forth and so on, have multiple measures, and what's the political support? Because this is a very political idea, and who is supporting it matters. I don't know, can you see this? I wonder when I put this together, is this okay? I don't know whether there was so much detail for you all go, what? This is, a, this is just a, a, a little, a little map of Boston area and the surrounding areas. The Metropolitan Council for Educational Opportunity, METCO, is the longest continuous uh, inter-district desegregation plan we have. It started out as a smaller program called Project Exodus from Boston. It's a grassroots program. In 1965 and 1966, it became Metropolitan, became Metco. Now this is an interesting 
This is a very interesting plan. It serves over 3,000 students, but the waiting list is over 10,000 students. The waiting list is over 10,000 students. It's a one-way racial balancing program uh, with transfer students coming from Boston to, to other suburbs in Springfield and other suburban districts. It is extremely, um, there is support for this program. Uh, the, the center of it's in Roxbury, which is a predominantly African-American community in Boston. Uh, the schools, the receiving schools, the suburbs get $5,000. There is support for transportation. There is a great deal of support for these young people. It's not just sort of, you know, I hope it works out for you. There's counseling about this college, counseling about academics, uh, social emotional counseling, because this is a, a big deal to get on a bus and to travel to a new, uh, neighborhood that's not your own. And of course, we're not going to talk about this tonight, but there's also a lot of, within schools themselves, there's a lot of um, segregation, sometimes intentional, sometimes uh, just uh, by the way the school's organized. Um, the outcomes for the MEDCO program are, are very good. One of the things we don't have is we don't have as much data about this as we would like, but that we have done, the research that has taken place, has really uh, demonstrated that if you're sort of thinking about it a little bit analytically now for a second, if you hold constant sort of backgrounds of the kids and so forth and so on, students who participated in the MEDCO program did consistently a great deal better than students in Boston who did not participate in the MEDCO. Um, there was no harm done to any other students, that's sort of one of the mythologies about it. In fact, there's a lot of evidence to show that actually having a diverse classroom actually increases learning, actually increases all students' ability to learn. So the MEDCO program is, is vibrant, probably would be a lot bigger if there was more money invested in it, but it's, the, it's, it's one of the first. John talked a great deal about Hartford, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. But Hartford is a, uh, a city that's predominantly, is, the inner city is poor, uh, predominantly people of color, and it's in a pretty much a white uh, suburban New, New England environment. It, this is a two-way program, and it has a few features. We just fasten on for a minute, and then we'll, we'll when we have our, we'll have our discussion, we can talk about it. We use magnet schools, and school, open schools of choice, and the state of Connecticut made investment in those schools. There's quite a few of them. They're, you know, to get together, they're well over almost 100 of them. So that they knew that they were going to have to create schools that would, would make student, have people, have students be interested in attending no matter what their backgrounds were. Um, they, uh, there's a lottery system. There is a, um, something called affirmative marketing because what they, the attempt to get some kind of racial balance given the legal constraints that is a chance to really, through their um, school uh, choice resource center, they are able to uh, confer with parents, give them ideas about the choices they may have, and it's trying to, trying to creatively and affirmatively not treat this as a problem, but as an opportunity. And that's how we should think about it. Not as a problem, but as an opportunity. It's not unlike a school choice program in um, Cambridge, Massachusetts, called Control Choice. We won't get off topic, but Control Choice also uses some of these elements, um, and that's been going in Cambridge, you know, uh, Cambridge in, uh, outside of Boston for years. And they look at Omaha. Omaha is a very interesting case. Omaha, Nebraska. And John, correct me. I probably get some of this a little. Uh, I get this right. Um, so they had an interesting piece of legislation at the end of the 19th century in Omaha, which is that the city of Omaha could annex small towns next to it for reasons of educational reasons. And, uh, and that was kind of what was in place for quite a while. After World War II, uh, there was middle class and white folks began to leave Omaha and move to the suburbs. So you had this disparity and this clear distinction between the city of Omaha and the surrounding towns. And in fact, it went so far as the surrounding towns wanted to withdraw from, from the Omaha School District and set up their own school district, which is District 66. So it wasn't just de facto segregation, it was a case of actual de jure segregation. Um, then, 
I'm not going to go through all the details. There are many, many attempts to break this down, to change it. It was politically uh, extremely volatile uh, and so forth. And, uh, 2006, the state legislature, remember we talked about who does it, in this case it was the legislature in, in, um, in Nebraska, Bob Rakes, um, came up with the idea, he was head of the education committee, he came up with this idea that they would have a regional plan. Now, I want you to think how politically complicated that is. It was achievement to pull this off. I don't want to just go by this and say, oh, you know, that happened. It didn't happen without a lot of influential people coming together, discussing it, figuring out what worked best, and including a broader community. So uh, the Rakes plan included regional governance, so you're breaking out of school boundaries, tax sharing and resource redistribution, which we all can figure out is not going to always be that easy, and a diversity plan. And they had a regional governance system, which was the Learning Community Coordinating Council, established magnet schools and transportation subsidies. Now, this worked pretty well, uh, but in 2016, there was a change of heart in the Nebraska legislature, and they kind of did away with the redistribution of tax uh, levy, money that was came from the tax levy, and they, um, they went back to sort of giving a grant or something to the schools in the inner city, but without necessarily the grant, the tax levy. Once again, the evidence, the evidence that we do have on this is very strong that the students who were able to participate um, in this regional plan, through, there were many pieces to it, which I'm not going to give you, it's in your, it's in the report, it was a whole thing around elementary schools and so forth, actually did much better than the other students. And why is that? Why is that? Because they had access to resources, they had access to how, uh, highly qualified teachers, or at least adequate teachers. Uh, they were in a classroom that was diverse, it wasn't, John mentioned something before about concentrated poverty. A lot of this issue has to do with when you get any poor children, all they go to school with is other poor children, it's highly concentrated poverty. We know from the research, we know from common sense, we know just from being human beings, that this is very difficult for many young people to overcome. So these three plans were, have, were, 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 were bold innovations. Often led by litigators like John and, and uh, educators, sometimes politicians, sometimes people from the community. Um, so, what do you, what's the lessons that we can learn? And then I'm going to sit down and we're going to ask some questions. Uh, well, one is you have to have an agreement. That's easy to say, but hard to do. And uh, the, cat, the, the, the example, I think, Omaha is a good example of that. Ron Rakes unfortunately died in an accident earlier in his life than he should have. And the fact that he left the scene actually made it much harder to carry because he was pushing it and he had the influence to be able to do it structurally. Now, establish a clear educational vision for what we mean by educational vision uh, equity. There's a narrow, there's a narrow ideas that you can have, and they're not bad. I mean, you need to have them. When I say narrow, you know, you can say that you, you can talk about the money and you can talk about distribution of racial balance, you can talk about a variety of other things, but there has to be something bigger and more profound than that too. Equal opportunity is not just a phrase that people throw around and it sounds nice, it's fundamental. It's not just fundamental to the lives of children, it's fundamental to our democracy. You take that away, that disappears. One of the, one of the foundations of I believe in democracy begins to be eroded, and we, we see that actually, I think, uh, in lots of polling about people ideas about democracy today. Sustain efforts with equitable resources, and that's really important. I've done a little bit in New York and I've been around the issues of equitable resources, and there's a wide disparity in New York between the resources that are available to school districts. Even though New York has the highest per pupil expenditure rate in the nation, but there's still high disparities. And when you say high disparities, that, that isn't like some abstract idea. That means less, fewer teachers. That means no computers. That means the food, which I, which always somehow seems very symbolic to me, but the food, but it also has to do with, with health care. So it isn't, it isn't just an idea. It results in real deprivation for a lot of students. And then avoid a, a, an evaluation plan. We don't know enough. Really, I know everybody with the sort of types are always saying this, but we don't really know enough about the outcomes to really be able to put a firm stake in the ground 
We want to be able to do that, but we also want it not just to be a narrow math, science, reading really kind of thing. We want it to be the whole student, the whole child. How can we support the whole child? What are the measures that will let us know whether we're doing that or not? And then when we're failing, when we're succeeding, hallelujah, and when we're failing, uh, what can we do to rectify it? So that's, I'm gonna stop talking. And I hope that you're stimulated enough to ask some really hard questions about this and you know, anything that you like. And, uh, and thank you very much. Um, we are so privileged to have a moderator here tonight, and you're just going to excuse me for a second because... Then I don't have it memorized, so excuse me that. So we are really, really privileged and honored tonight to have Miss Tiffany Lanks Lankies as our um, moderator. And um, Tiffany is the Communications Director for the Education Trust New York, a nonprofit organization focused on research and policy advocacy around education equity issues. Prior to joining um, Edge Trust New York in 2017, Tiffany worked as an education reporter for 14 years, most recently at the Buffalo News. She's written extensively about equity issues, including the achievement gap and school segregation. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Tiffany. Uh, thanks for having me, and it's great to have both of you gentlemen here in our community to have this really important conversation. Um, and I think to add a little additional framing and context um, for the audience, the research out of the uh, Civil Rights Project, Gary Orville in California, shows that New York is the most segregated state in the country. Um, a finding that was very shocking when that research came out, because I think most people would assume it was somewhere in the South, not a state like New York that likes to believe we're very progressive. And then within that, Buffalo is um, one of the more segregated regions. But we're one of the communities in New York State that I don't think has really had this conversation about interdistrict um, integration. There's been a lot of focus in the city, which was under a desegregation order, saw some positive outcomes, which have since disappeared. Um, but I think this gets to kind of one of your framing questions of who starts this conversation, or how does this conversation start in communities um, in a productive way? Yeah. <laughs> I'll always defer to John. From my experience, you have to start with the educational authorities. And the educational authorities are largely your school board and your superintendent. For an example, over the past eight years, I sometimes switched my hat in being on the outside and agitate, sometimes suing, school boards and superintendents, creating a consulting firm, and going on the inside and working with the Board of Education and with the superintendent and various other administrators, along with next support from the community. When we brought the chef case, for example, we took almost eight years of holding focus sessions and talking with people about what was best for the future of education and best for the economy and the life of people in Connecticut, especially in the Hartford Capital Region. And we've done the same thing as we work with school districts in Charlotte Mecklenburg, work with the school district in California, Pasadena Unified School District, and more. And then you have to uh, bring in largely some of your large business organizations, such as the Chamber of Commerce that we work with in Wake County, North Carolina, in the partnership. And we work with uh, education departments, such as here at Canisius College. We work with other business and industry in terms of determining their future workforce. And that was especially true in North Carolina with this area they call the Research Triangle situated down between Raleigh, North Carolina and Durham, North Carolina, home of UNC and Duke University and others, to uh, help 
make the educational system meet the workforce needs of tomorrow. Like I quoted in that uh, case from the Connecticut and from the New Jersey cases about uh, where some of that workforce will come from in the future. So it's all those kinds of players that's uh, necessary. And it takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, but in the end, I think the results are worth it. Yeah, I think, I think that's true. In Boston, we do have a strong community base there. And um, so I think in Bellamy, the community is going to be, it's going to be stabilized over a period of time. It seems to have, to have some, at least from that perception, some real grassroots support. I think it has to be authentic. I think it has to feel really, truly authentic to people. Any of these policy reforms, if they don't feel authentic to people, I mean, people experiencing it. So the one glimmer of this conversation I think we've had in Erie County was years ago when Buffalo students were given the right to transfer to a higher performing school if their school was put on the state watch list. The city school district did not have enough schools to accommodate those students, so the idea was floated for them to attend school in the suburbs, and people went nuts. Um, this is obviously a highly politicized issue. I think you both kind of touched on that. Um, but what would you say about navigating those politics, which quite frankly can get pretty nasty in these conversations? Well, I don't think there's a stellar example. Um, I do think that actually the Omaha example, well actually Hartford too, I think the Omaha example is a path forward. I just don't want to be negative about this. Um, I think what happened Omaha is kind of what John said with that would be. People in positions who are in a position to write policy, legislators and others, and newspaper writers and people who were really attempting to, to try to change the system, which was so bold, so unfair to so many children. Um, I think they were able to do the political work that needs to be done, to understand compromise, to listen to people to be patient, being willing to take a lot of guff, probably. Um, maybe, no matter how you know, the time being to be sick. But I think without that political savvy and determination, it's hard to happen. Now, where that comes from, usually has to come from certain dedicated, inspired people who are just going to do this. And so, I don't know where that comes from, but I think that's necessary. Maybe not sufficient, but necessary. I would say, too, we have a little risk of a too strong statement. But the proponents of school diversity and school integration for its educational values that you've heard has to stem with those who oppose it. And to some extent, African Americans, a number of Latinx, and the concept in the last decade of charter schools largely reinforces segregation. And in my writing, I call them the non-integrationist or the self-segregation. And even President Obama's policy for seven years with Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan, and Race to the Top and these competitive grants were bitten, back, bitten bound on changing what they call dropout factories through turnaround procedures. And so I support anyone who wants to approve education with or without integration. But integration, I'm convinced, by all the social science research and studies, is certainly a documented advantageous remedy. But over the years, we've sat down with the charter school community. We've sat down with those who are opposed to integration to see if we can find some common ground, make some inroads. And now we do have an organization of around 30 a charter school organizations throughout the country, including some of the big corporation charter schools who are willing to embark on efforts to increase school diversity within charter schools. That's interesting. I think
think, Alice, one more question before we open it up to the audience. Um, I think one of the kind of negative outcomes that you sometimes hear about, and uh, Rochester's written quite a bit about this, they have an urban-suburban program, is sometimes students leave the city school district and do get a seat in a suburban district, but they find when they get there that they don't necessarily have access to those advanced courses that their white classmates do. Um, or they encounter racial bias because sometimes the suburban districts are just not as culturally responsive um, as they should be. So I, I guess what would be your word of caution or your advice or what have you seen in these other places to make sure that when students are making that move that they are getting a, an opportunity to have access to those um, educational benefits? Well, I am so glad you asked that question because it is not enough to formally integrate a school. We know that from experience and research. Schools have cultures that are powerful. And if you're a person that doesn't grow up in that culture or has immediately accepted that culture, they can be isolating, they can be scary, they can be alienating. So there's Anybody who wants to integrate a school has to really think deeply. There was a school, a uh, high school outside of Chicago, Highland High School, that was founded on the principles of integration. And uh, recently there's been a lot of press about the fact that it kind of ended up being two societies, even though that was the underlying ethos of it. Uh, we need responsive curriculum. We need, we need teachers of color and leaders of color. We need to have a curriculum that's relevant to all kids, but by all I mean all. We need to be sure that we don't have a implicit bias or an explicit bias where a student of color somehow doesn't get into the advanced uh, you know, AP courses. Uh, we know that there is disparities in how discipline is exercised. Again, this is, so these are facts. Um, the same offense, uh, a student of color, especially a male, um, you're going to get very likely a very different treatment than if you're a white student. So these, these racial divides that are in our culture are played out every day inside our schools. And we, we need to tackle this problem directly. There has to be a lot of truth telling, honest conversations, and then policies that, that the people in the schools, the people now and the adults in the school, have to really live, 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 not just give, you know, lip service to it. Um, until we come to that recognition, I fear that we're also setting ourselves up to try to decide what else. Um, that's a huge one. I'm going to have to get away with it. There is a mic here. Yeah, I have to use the mic. Okay. You do have a question. You can kind of line up over here. And we'll take them I guess I should put my lower hand in the form you, as I'm sure the uh, folks did at this uh, event, it being recorded. Oh, but I'm scared of anybody wearing a mask. No, don't be scared. Thank you so much for being here today and sharing your understanding knowledge with one of us. Um, one of the questions that came to mind, and I always advocate uh, a little bit of uh, this view um, in, in my classes, is what's the role of the um, state in, in, these, in advocating for these type of programs? You know, it seems that uh, we are always working within the same paradigm of decentralized uh, systems of education. But there is also a lot to be said about the process of recentralization to some extent which is some of the ideas that are uh, underneath uh, your rational of regional you know, arrangements. Um, so I, I wonder, within your own uh, studies, um, you know, how can we see the role of the state in advance some of these um, you know, uh, responses you know, to um, desegregation, uh, so to speak? I'll take a first shot at the uh, structural relationship of your excellent question. It starts at the top with the Constitution of States on the fundamental right to a fair, to a minimum, to a suitable, to an educational opportunity. 
That is the state's responsibility. However, the state delegates that right to local school districts, and that's called local control. And there is no constitutional, no common law, no statutory law other than the regulations that completely allows local control through local districts to run their schools the way they do. But the reason they nevertheless run the schools the way they do without any real concern for the state except that they want more money from them is because, and I think this is part of the problem, local school funding is based upon property tax. And the local share of school funding is greater than the state's appropriation for education. And that's what makes local control, although a myth, turn into a reality of what they will and they will not do. And it's a kind of me, in mind, attitude towards education that leads to any kind of resistance to a broader regional education elite, especially in this Northeast, Mid-Atlantic, geographical context of a number of local school boards, local superintendents, local finance, local administration, local, 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 and duplication. Mm -hmm. The ideal, like a Charlotte Mecklenburg in North Carolina, the largest school district in North Carolina, is to try and create greater regional education, either at the county level, the way it is in many southern, and Midwestern and other states, or at least try and create more voluntary regional forms of education. Uh, I, I think part of what your question is, is public education in the United States is unbelievably uh, decentralized. Uh, compared to Europe, or probably any country, or maybe it's in New Zealand, I'm not sure, but uh, compared to almost any country, I think this plays out in people's lives. A few years ago, I did a study in the Midwest, in the state, that, uh, and uh, we were looking at outlier schools, schools that had students who had very low income, but the schools themselves seemed to be better, at least in terms of the schools. We went through the state. I went to a, a rural park, because most of the study was in urban areas, but we went to a rural uh, school. And, um, one of the big issues in that school, and uh, sort, of, sort of half saying it facetiously, but actually it was very serious, was that they merged with another school district, and the question was, who's going to be the school mascot in which district? Now, for, for somebody coming from the urban area, say, really? But actually, for those, for those folks, because their grandparents went there, their parents went there, it, it, was, a deep, it was an emotional experience. So the the you break you know the football and all that was tied into it. So um, people have loyalty to their schools, which is laudable. It gets in the way, I think, can undermine issues of equity dramatically. Um, and, and sometimes the conversation is disguised. I appreciated uh, just now your reference to the South. So I, I went to school in the South in a county-based system in Florida. And I certainly saw the ways that that was intended to be good, but also the ways that students were tracked and segregated within schools um, in separate buildings um, and those kinds of things. Um, and so when I came when I came back to the, to the Northeast and to this area, I was sort of shocked by how carved up districts are. So we have a first dream suburb of Buffalo, um, Cheektowaga, that has five school districts within it. That's just one of the first dream suburbs that has five school boards and superintendents, um, and there are many, many more. That's sort of an extreme example, but so the idea of building allies um, and, and finding those school boards and getting all of those politicians 
um, to talk about this seems really daunting. Um, but something that I've, I've thought about and wondered is how now that we have a uh, migration of, 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 of refugee and immigrant students from Buffalo out to these first spring suburbs, there's a, there's a need uh, that exists. So Buffalo and, and the city school district has expertise in multilingual education that, that all of those Cheektowaga districts do not have. Um, and so are there examples around the country where there's where, where something has sort of started to happen because the suburban districts see a need for resources that exist in the city rather than the reverse, which I think is often the case. We see that we want our, our urban students to have access to suburban resources, but, but maybe if we think about what's beneficial to the suburban districts and sort of sell it that way, um, we might have more hope. That's a really good question. John, I'm going to throw this one to you. I'm going to answer your question this way. Of the best example I've seen for a common benefit among very diverse groups in every way that you can see difference. It's not at the K through 12 level, but it's in higher education. But it's an example. In higher education, by like school integration, the concept of, quote, affirmative action, to create greater diversity through admissions, higher education. Big Suit just came down from Harvard. Another one just came down from the University of North Carolina. The state of Texas created what was known as the top 10% plan. And they created the plan after an appellate court down there had struck down quote, affirmative action or using race sensitive, not in any quota, not in any complete sense, but factoring in with other GPA and grade point and geography and writing and band and sports and other categories. And the top 10% plan said that anyone who's a high school graduate finishing the top 10% of their class is automatically admitted to one of the top Texas public universities, such as the University of Texas, Texas A&M. And the plan lasted while this court case was going on in another big court case involving the University of Michigan solved the question in the Texas case. And Texas went back to some of the more conventional admissions criteria using race in a very careful and sensitive process. And the question was, should they eliminate the top 10 plan? Over five or six years went by, mainly white urban districts never were able to send their students to the more select schools, like University of Texas and A&M, had that chance, and I call it, they liked the taste of it, and they didn't want to eliminate it from the menu. And it created political diversity, economic and social diversity, ethnic diversity, certainly geographic diversity from all parts of the states. And there was an overwhelming coalition to defeat any effort to change it. You fast forward, it was a big case back in 2013, 2015, involving the University of Texas in affirmative action. I was asked to write an amicus brief for over 54 Texas legislators of all racial, ethnic, two Republicans, the rest Democrats, in geographic areas in support of this top 10% plan. And many others joined in. That's the best example where there were mutual interests among different kinds of economic, social, ethnic, political groups on a common goal to keep this 10% plan because those who had not had access to some of the best University of Texas and Texas public institutions of higher learning got that opportunity and didn't want to lose it. We should yeah, find something like that, regional diversity in case of trouble education. The question actually reminds me of a conversation I had once with John King, who was Obama's second Secretary of Education. He's now the CEO of the National Ed Trust. But when I was a reporter in Rochester, kind of posed the question of, 
what can you, in your role as Commissioner of Education in New York State, do to force this conversation? And his answer I thought was really interesting because I think he was dabbling in this conversation in Albany and said, if you get at any business leader the state's education budget and said, how would you organize this? No one in their right mind would come up with 700 independent school districts with 700 school boards. And I thought that framing was, was really interesting. Obviously, you don't want to take away from the equity lines. But I think there's, when you look at resource allocation, mm -hmm. um, you know, and his other prediction was now that New York State has a property tax cap and the suburban districts can't just keep jacking up their property taxes when they want to pay teachers more and enrollment is declining. Eventually, they will start to feel that need um, for resources. And that might be a starting point for the conversation. I, I think, I think, I think we have to convince our folks that the world that they're living in and their children are living in, if you don't, if you cannot understand, work with, trust people of other backgrounds, you're just on a purely selfish basis, your chances of mobility are extremely limited. We are living, I don't mean this is a controversial point, I think it's obvious, but we are living in a globalized world. And people, there are all sorts of skills that are associated with it. Um, Linda, I call them the drawing hammer, but a book called The Flat Earth, but there's that world, but there's, there's all kinds of books around this now. So isolating yourself is self-defeating for your children. And I don't know quite how we get this message out, but that's the message that really needs to be out there, I think. what we're trying to do here is address educational inequities that are happening right here in our backyard in the city of Buffalo. And some of the biggest challenge that we were faced with um, at, you know, while really looking at the disparities between um, what does the education, you know, quality look like right here in the city versus the suburbs, was the fact that we have very much different demographics in the city versus the suburbs. And therefore, you can't feed everybody with the same spoon. Um, and uh, while trying to kind of catch up, you know, to, to, to these disparities, we had a large number of new Americans coming right here to Buffalo as refugees. As of right now, we have more than 7,000 um, English language learners in the city of Buffalo. Um, we have 80% um, of our students in Buffalo qualify for free and reduced lunch. So poverty is a serious question here. But while trying to address all these questions, there is one thing that I personally focus on because I come from a background from higher education is what, the, what role do higher education institutions play in addressing the access to um, equal educational opportunities for our students? Because oftentimes the players that are missing from the table are the higher education institutions. So, Well, I think, well, I'll just speak for myself. Uh, I'm just at the higher education level, but I don't want to pontificate too much about this. Also, I'll just tell you what I think. Um, I think that universities and colleges, by and large, play a major role in perpetuation of these problems, uh, for the admissions policies. Uh, but again, go also to larger cultural issues as well. But, um, I, I think in terms of education, um, to be honest, 
I think that I've worked in a number of schools of education, and I think that while there's often um, a sort of list service paid to these issues that we've been talking about today, that the, the programs themselves are some really manifest this and don't really reach out in the ways that we need to. One of the real crises that we face is the lack of diversity in the teaching profession. Um, and that's not just, again, sort of a nice thing, that's, that's a very practical issue. And I think the role of universities and, and colleges have a major role to play in beginning to resolve that problem through admissions and support, through curriculum that makes cultural sense and so forth and so on. So I think there's work to be done in the higher ed in this regard. I'll just leave it at that. John, do you want to bring this? It's a great topic. Hello, uh, my name is Leah Hoffman and I'm a student studying education here at Canisius. And my question is in regards to the parents and guardians of those students that have abilities to move to different school districts. And um, just a question about how accessible is the information for the families to have their students move between districts? Because from my understanding here in Buffalo is that sometimes information isn't available as quickly or easily as we would like for the families, especially for those that are coming from different countries or their English may not be their first language. Is there any like regulations or um, rules on how they have the information presented to families within those districts? Could you, could you do me a favor? I didn't get all of your questions. Could you come back and ask that question again? Because I want to give you the right answer. Tell me the right answer. Yeah, just go ahead. Save the table. Um, this is a huge question. The question is, the question really has to do is, what kind of parental information is there, particularly for folks who don't, maybe English may not be their first language, and they may be immigrants and so forth, and how does that work? I, I think actually in the Boston case, there's quite a bit of effort made in that regard. Um, I don't know, John, I'll let you handle, I'll let you handle a part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in the Omaha case, I think, I don't, I think that was also the case. Um, parent resource centers and so forth. Now, how effective that is, uh, you know, how effective that is, I, I can't judge, because I'm only really looking at it from a distance. But your point, I think your point is right on target, which is that if we don't have information, then the whole thing ultimately falls apart. Yes. Yes, you know, they're really reaching into a really a huge, one of the core problems that we face in these areas, whether it's concentrated poverty or immigrants or folks from other countries who may not speak English, which is their first language. Um, honestly, I think in my experience, not, 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 not talking necessarily about the, what we're talking about today, I think the resources are very limited. The states that I've been to have done other studies. Um, those children often don't have information with their parents. You know, here's the other thing too. If you're a middle class person, you don't have any fear of walking into a school and asking for things. And if you're an upper class person, you just assume that it belongs to you anyway. But if you're poor or you're, you're, you've had a bad experience in school or you're an immigrant or maybe you're, maybe you're, maybe you're worried about your status here, going to school is actually can be very difficult and a scary experience. And we need to find ways to make schools make that not that way. Um, I think we can think of some one-off examples by great principals and teachers, but as a system, I don't think we do very well by those young people. At least that's my perception of the job. I agree. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Thank you. Great question. Yes. Don't be shy with your questions. <laughs> go, go for it. <laughs> I'd like to address this question to Professor Lynn. So, what regulations, policies, laws are there to enforce um, or force districts to be more um, culturally inclusive of populations of English language learners who are oftentimes, I hate to use the term immigrants or refugees because in Buffalo we have lots of Puerto Rican students and they don't necessarily fall under that umbrella. So just from a national level but a state level as well. Again, using my mantra of running with the educational policy laws, both of those two prior questions are very relevant. In my school assignment plan, that's the key words of what determines where students go to school, including neighborhood schools, sometimes special admissions through test schools, sometimes magnet schools, sometimes through inner district diversity schools, and all the other educational opportunities with uh, children with disabilities, children with uh, English uh, language learning. And it basically takes advocates. And we need to create more activist advocacy groups. One of the successes of the CHEF case is that we created the CHEF movement, but it's a nonprofit organization that's uh, continued for these 20 plus years in helping to inform parents and students of their choices under the system, helping them navigate the application process and being an advocate in the press and in the board meetings and with the superintendent to try and maximize the benefits from the quote chef remedy to as many parents and many students as possible. But that's where we really need organizations like yours for more grassroots advocacy efforts on behalf of helping students navigate, as we discussed in the uh, reception, through the educational opportunities for them. We actually run into this with our organization, and we, one of the things we advocate for at the state level is when the states are releasing things, especially that are parent-facing, that they do get them translated, not just into Spanish, but into multiple languages, and they're not just using translate to you and doing it the right way. Um, so I think asking is definitely the first step and then really kind of pushing on until we do that. One of the things you touched on briefly, I think we could talk about while people are not really pulling their questions, is um, kind of coming up with a plan to track effectiveness. So what does mm -hmm. that look like? like? What benchmarks are you looking at? What does a successful integration model look like? Well, I would be, I'll, I'll say something that actually would be very interesting to see what John says from a legal point of view and an educational point of view. But from my point of view, what would, a, what would a successful plan look like? Well, I would like to visualize a school, first off, with adequate and equitable, stable resources. So it has to actually have the resources it has. And, uh, school building, curriculum, teachers, all the things I mentioned when I was talking. I, I think that's a, that's a, a, a simple one. If you're sending folks into a research poor, desperate situation, that doesn't make any sense. They don't care what their background is. It doesn't make any sense. And that goes to their personal needs, and it goes to their emotional needs, it goes to their physical needs, and it certainly goes to their intellectual needs. You can't have it that teachers who can't make it to other schools somehow get transferred to a school like that. So the resources are critical. The second thing is, is that we have to have an ethos of, of recognizing the historical harms that have been done, dealing with them frankly, at the same time saying we're going to make this better. And how does that happen? It comes through a pedagogical philosophy of I'm more of the progressive education type, so forgive me, but a, 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 a pedagogical philosophy in which experience matters, where we have things like portfolios, where we accept the fact that not everybody treats learning exactly in the same way, 
I said, because there may be for some times for teachers to do that. Um, I think we have to have a curriculum that reaches out beyond the traditional, uh, you know, curriculum. One time I went to a school, uh, I went to an English class, and these were all students, um, minority students, and students of color, and then the curriculum was supposed to read these books by Albert Camus, a uh, French existentialist mm -hmm. author and writer. Uh, I think Albert Camus is a genius. Is it exactly the right book for a 10th grader in this neighborhood? I don't think so. So um, I, 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 I think that's really good. Do you know the data on the number of high school students that are bored is startling? That should be a front, that, that should be like a frontline headline almost every day. Just bored. How many few high school students find a teacher that they feel that they can trust and support them? So um, that's the kind of school I would want to see. And certainly the governance of the school has to be democratic. I mean, it varies a little bit in circumstances and people, but by that it's a small thing, not a big thing. It has to be democratic because kids, young people are, we all are, they're very sensitive to injustice. And once they feel this injustice has been perpetrated on, this is goes beyond racial or ethnic differences, once they feel that injustice, especially if it's more than one, so to speak, it's very hard for them to bring their full talents, because that's what we want, bring their full talents to the school. So discipline practices, restorative justice, we know there are things that are better than others. Restorative practices and so forth actually do make a difference in schools. In answer to your question, I've seen the full scope, particularly in some of the court-ordered, quote-unquote, segregation plans, where there were counselors who rode the bus or other means of transportation from the point of pickup to the schools. There were counselors to uh, greet the students and help them navigate into a new environment and throughout the year be their counselor with the programs, particularly ensure that they were enrolled in after school programs and they have after school counseling. And as uh, my colleague, Dr. Cookson was saying, was just to check in with them, to see how they're doing, how the family's doing, and to uh, help them as long as possible through this transition. As time goes on and these programs are really working, when the first budget cut comes, these extra counselors and other persons are the first ones to be reduced in force, rift, cut. And now it's hard to even get them in the budget in the plan, although educators know, administrators know, it's essential for success in any of these uh, transfer programs. Gentlemen, uh, earlier today you mentioned that since the report came out last February that you've given a presentation, this is the third or fourth time that you've given a, a talk on the report. I'm interested in the response to the report that you've received previously, either from the release or from the other communities that you've talked in, and are there other uh, communities that are considering what Omaha, Boston, Hartford are doing, or what, what has been the general response from the Well, I think the I think the response to the report has been good. I, I again, I don't know if I have any. I wish I had some real hard data that I could uh, give you. Um, I think that it. Well, you know, let me frame it a little differently. I think there's a suite of reports that we've done. Some of which you have here, and I think the impact of those reports actually is. Well, it's a sound. I think it has contributed to changing the conversation a little bit. When, I, when we first started this, the issue of school finance equity, of which this is one piece of it, because uh, it's particularly tied to integration, was not necessarily the most uh, hot topic, so to speak, in the policy world. It's become a really huge topic nationally. So I think it's contributed to that. I, 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 I have never encountered anything, you know, about this report that made people push back in any significant way. But that doesn't mean they were thinking it, they just didn't say it. But I, I think, just to say, 
we need to push very hard, whether it's through district desegregation plans or whatever it is, on this issue of school financing, particularly here in New York, uh, because the differences are stark, but throughout the country. And uh, we work with the National Conference of School Legislators here in Boston Institute. We have a, we have a very robust ongoing program with them in which we bring state legislators together to discuss issues of school finance equity and adequacy. Some of it's a little technical, but a lot of it is more political and policy. And um, that has become a bigger and bigger goal. I am going to New Jersey around the third week of November in a big meeting with many players in education try and create some of the plans in the report that we have given today. And it starts with the governor, it comes down to the legislative leadership, it includes the unions, it includes the local legislators, it includes all of the civil rights organizations. And it is instigated by a large lawsuit that was brought last May. But in a good sign, it has been put on hold to try and work through some ways that at least some plans can come out of it to promote greater diversity through regional schooling, starting small in certain parts. And I think that's a good start. It's a good effort. But the cloud of the case hangs over it. But it is producing at least coming to the table to talk. It's interesting. I think that gets to the point. One of the big takeaways, I think, for me was the voluntary component. So as opposed to you know the state coming in and saying, we're forcing you to do this and getting the pushback. Um, and, it, and one of the concepts that really intrigues me is kind of these regional schools, these magnet schools. Um, and I think one of the audience members made the point about resources. Sometimes you look at even the career tech programs in the city school districts, and they're way more than you can find in the suburban district with those kind of resources. So I'm just curious, what have you seen that makes a successful regional magnet school that people from a more affluent district will leave their local community to maybe go to the city of Buffalo to have their child in that school? In the Connecticut situation, I found that transportation is a big incentive of where the school is located, not only how it's performing, and whether it's convenient for parents who are largely transporting the child. You know, I always say, when they pick on a poor school bus, that they're against busing. It's really a sign that they're against the school assignment plan, because the bus is essential to school, as the building, the teachers, the budget, the curriculum, the athletics, the band, the music, and the rest of school. And so, in terms of this effort at the incentives for these magnet schools is really the program. And in the Connecticut case, for an example, some of the most popular schools are located in the city. And actually, we got a problem now where more suburban students, both of color as well as Caucasians, are flocking to these magnet schools that were set up for urban and suburban. And it's freezing out many of the urban children and their parents and the legislators are saying we create these magnets in our school district geography and we're being shut out of them and it leads them to frustration and opposition for the magnet plane. And so we're dealing with too much success from the suburbs on the downside but on the upside it shows that you can't attract Suburban parents of all colors and all social and economic groups 
It's located in the right place and it's performing at the right level. To follow up on that though, when you're just starting out and you, the parents don't have any context, I mean, maybe you can hire a really dynamic single leader that they'll recognize, but obviously in its first two years, parents don't really have results to base that on. So if you're just starting one of these schools, it sounds like obviously a strong and dynamic program will help, but are there other things you can do for that early, early draw? Yes, in Connecticut, even before the suit, when we use it as a key part of the uh, remedy, is that we work with Hartford to create a, a form of a magnet school in the performing arts. And it came to have the best school for the music arts, the uh, drawing arts, the play arts, and we started with a half day in their homeschool district, and the other half with extended day in the arts. And it was very successful. And now it's moved into a full education and art school. And that's the kind of attraction and kind of creativity that is required. Are we doing questions? <laughs> if, if the audience doesn't have questions, I guess I would just invite any parting thoughts or advice if there's people in the room that want to take this on. My parting thought is that I live with the aspiration of hope. I never give up. 50 years I've been trying in all ways. I should continue. And I think it begins with just conversation and with education. Not only of identifying the problem, that's easy, but trying to come up with some kind of remedy, no matter how small to advance the cause. <laughs> um, all I can say is I've never had a day in my life when I didn't think education was important. I don't always pay what you want and so forth, but I've never had a day ever when I didn't think it was important. So to me, it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really noble thing to fight for these causes. Yes, there's your notes and there's your notes. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much. Yes, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, John. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Tiffany, for this really engaging conversation. And my only regret is that this whole room is packed because this is such an important conversation and that so many people in our community really need to hear this. So I feel a responsibility. I feel inspired, but I feel a responsibility, and I hope you do too, to continue this conversation when you go home, you know, in your context, in your, in your environments, because it can't end here, you know. Um, Really, um, so thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here. Um, both Professor Britton and, and Dr. Cookson have agreed to hang out a little bit longer. It's how long they've been hanging out a little bit longer. So if anybody would like to come up and have a private conversation, um, you know, you'll have the opportunity to do that. So good night. Thank you so much, and safe traveling home.